Okay, um, our next track is from MHS, specifically DCMHS, about the new HPMs that we've been working on. So I've introduced myself. My name is Brian. I work for Intel. Andy Junkins, AMD. Uh, Mike Gregoire, Dell. So we get a lot of questions on HPM specifications. Um, so I thought I'd focus the slide just on this question. Um, in 2022, we released a set of spe specifications for the host processor modules called MFLW and MDNO. Um, those were specifically geared around 19-inch racks. The idea w um, that we had been discussing with the 21-inch racks, uh, folks, is that you, you know, it's basically the smaller building block, right? You can have it in 19 or 21, and there's examples of that out on the floor. The idea behind these two specs is that we're sort of in a, what we call a maintenance mode. I won't go through all the details here, but you can see we've continued to release uh, our 1.1 updates in Q1 of 24 this year. Um, we have 1.2 updates coming out. The, the basic idea around the maintenance updates is uh, alignment to our new specification that we'll be talking more about in this presentation called MSDNO, as well as you know fixing typos um, and better alignment between the specifications. So this track, I think, is focused mostly on our newest spec that we just released here um, in 2024 called MSDNO. And we're gonna touch on what are the key differences with this spec versus the previous specs. You can find MSDNO in the contribution database as well as on the wiki. So again, why a new specification? Um, you, you guys did all this work, um, why are you giving us another one? Do we have to choose between all three or is there reasons why we would pick one over the other? So like I mentioned, um, in 2022, we had MFLW and MDNO, and those were focused on 19-inch rack. But really, one of the key differences between those is there was no compatibility between those, right? So MDNO was really a density-optimized play, mostly around one socket. Um, MFLW was... Um, a traditional two socket board, right? So if you wanted one socket, it was sort of your MDNO. If you wanted two, it was your MFLW. And Andy's brought an example of this here where what we found is that this last year, this is an AMD um, Genoa, I wanna say, Andy. Yep. It has, uh, what you'll notice here is there's a lot of dims on it, right? So it's uh, 12 channel, two dims per channel, 24 dims, and you cannot fit two of those instances side by side. So what you'll notice on this board is that the whole CPU complex is shifted to one side. And the result of that shift means any high-speed routing to that far side um, MXIO connector is pretty long. And while this works great for PCI Gen 5, it doesn't work so great for PCI Gen 6 and beyond. Right, so we noticed this um, challenge that um, these are really optimized for one socket and two socket and not necessarily these large CPUs with large memory footprints. It outgrows the 19 inch boards pretty quickly. So the outcome of this is MS Dino, our scalable Dino. And my um, Workstream leads here will talk more about what scalable Dino means. So the initial thought we had was, why don't we just take Dino and change it to Dino version two, right? Kind of like OAI version one, OAI version two, they're not backwards compatible. But really, we had more aspirational goals with MS Dino. We also wanted it to scale the depth. So, um, you know, CPU power, GPU power is only going one direction, right? And that's up. Um, what we're finding is that these very small boards like MDNO Type 2 that you'll find out on the floor, these are not necessarily providing enough life, 
in, into the future, right? So hence this idea of MSD node that um, they'll talk more about. So to summarize, you know, we do plan to support all three specifications, the other two being maintenance updates. Michael, I think, will talk about what if I want to do a chassis that supports both of these, right? Maybe I have an optimized chassis for this, so he's going to touch on that. Um, but really, the, what we see going forward is the shift to MS Dino, as it provides much more flexibility that we'll get into. So my final slide before I give it to my um, co-leads here is that I wanted to talk kind of about the idea with behind MS Dino. What you'll see here is kind of three different chassis that I've just drawn a rectangle around. You'll notice that I didn't label it CPU, right? I labeled it X. Um, X could be a CPU, it could be a GPU, it could be an APU, it could be whatever. Um, the idea is that this is a compute block, right? So if you have GPUs in this chassis, if you have CPUs in this chassis, the idea is you can use um, a host processor module for that, um, that compute unit. Um, we, have, we show SCM and NIC down on the, the um, coplanar into the HPM, but there, we will be talking about um, what if we go vertical with um, that SCM so that we can ena enable more depth. But the idea behind Destino that you can see here is that we, we took it as these building blocks. So we have um, a set of building blocks for a 19-inch chassis. We have a set of building blocks for a 21-inch chassis. And there are building blocks that overlap between 19 and 20 um, that I think they'll talk more about. But you can see here the idea is it's a common fa uh, faceplate or, or back of the chassis, front of the chassis, whatever you want to call it, right? where you can have two one, one socket nodes or, or a dual socket node or four of these in a chassis. Um, I think the Dell, the Dell um, announcement described four of these um, in one chassis all using this SD node type of approach, right? Just think of it like the zones for the compute, right? And then the idea that we'll be working with in the future is connectivity between boards if you have different things. So you'll notice on the, the, the far right, I've shown like a, a gray X and a orange X. These could be different companies. These could be the same company. They could be both CPUs. They could be a CPU and a GPU. How do you, how do you connect between these two different blocks? And that's one of the things that we'll be working on over the next year. Okay, thank you, Brian. So getting into a little more detail about the new SDNO spec, um, one of the new things here is we define four what we call classes, so classes A, B, C, and D. Um, what distinguishes those classes fundamentally is the width of the HPM, so um, A being the smallest, D being the widest. Um, the scalability comes into play with the length of the HPM, so you have the ability to pick the length that suits your feature set, your requirements, it's constrained between 305 millimeters and 555 millimeters deep so that you have some deterministic you know, range bound um, um, HPMs that you can work with. We also define something that's called a common chassis interval. This is just a recommended depth, so if you're near that depth, if you could snap to it, it probably would make sense. Um, it just makes the uh, adoption and support that much easier. And there's also some economics built around the um, penalization that's associated with that depth. Um, so it's something you'll want to look at. Um, and, and then the other thing is, is a consistent feature set in terms of an SEM placement, uh, a NYX three slot, uh, riser uh, position, et cetera. That's defined in these classes for compatibility, um, similar to what you know, Brian just showed, where you can have single or dual or maybe quad HPMs in a, in a common chassis. And I'll talk a little more about that. Um, so, you know, if you're an HPM designer, you, I think you want to strive for the smallest HPM so that you have the maximum uh, possible adoption, of course. And if you're designing a chassis or a system, you'd obviously like to have the, the biggest volume for HPM so you have the maximum uh, compatibility in, in that direction, um, depending on your, your um, use case. So, um, and then I want to note that class A 
And class C will be our 19 inch uh, focused or optimized form factors. And you can think of a A as like a half wide and C as a full wide. And then B and D will be the same for the 21 inch rack. So kind of a half wide and full wide. Okay. Um, so kind of a matrix view of these classes then. Um, half wides on the left, full wides on the right, 19 inch at the top row, 21 inch in the bottom row. That's what they're targeting, targeted for. Um, but there is some crossover. So A being the smallest, um, and because we have a consistent I.O. relationship, you can have a chassis that supports, let's say it's designed for C, it supports two A's, okay, optionally. You can also have a, a class D, uh, a, a system that supports class D that could optionally support two B's, but it could also support two A's, all right? All right, go to the next slide. Okay, so scalability. So at the bottom of, this, of these HPM images, which we call the near, the near side, um, is kind of our fixed defined components, starting with the SEM on the left, the NIC3 slot on the right, um, and then we have uh, riser positions that are defined in the spec. Uh, these, are, these are kind of important elements then if you want to mix and match HPMs in a common, in a common chassis. Um, so those stay the same with in, within a, a, uh, a class. And what's, what's uh, flexible here, scalable then, like we said, is the depth. And uh, so at the north side of these bores, the far side as we call it, um, the, the features near those edges um, travel with the board edge uh, depth. So as you're changing the board edge depth for your application, those features will travel with that board edge. Um, in this example, we're just showing a, the contrasting in A335, which means class A335 deep, with an A315, which is a class A315 deep, and how those features just move. Um, but on the width, the class of class is, is rigid, right? So the width is done, does not scale. It is defined by that class, so a class A being 210 millimeters wide and the class B 250, for example. Okay, uh, another slide to kind of characterize some hypothetical mixing and matching that could be done, right? So on the left side of this matrix, we have, um, a, you know, kind of a description of a type of chassis and some uh, various HPM form factors, SD no form factors across the X. Um, if we start with the small edge chassis, so maybe this is very space constrained, it's very purpose built, and you built it around an A305 HPM, it won't fit any other HPM, right? So that's, that's the most restrictive example. Um, a 19 inch medium sized general, com general purpose compute chassis, um, maybe you built that around a C335, right? So you have a dual socket you want to support, it's a 19 inch chassis, you pick the C, You've defined a certain depth, depth limit based on other feature sets. Well, a, a C335 chassis can be designed such that it supports two A305s or two A335s or even one B335 or smaller. So that's the key thing. Whatever your largest HPM you support, you'll have a family or the potential for smaller HPMs that will still be compatible with that chassis. Um, a 21 inch chassis, so let's talk about a, the maximum size maybe here. Think of a we got an ORV3 with an 800 millimeter deep IT tray. Um, you could support a D335. You could also support uh, a D555 I had on here, or a, a two B555s, right? So a shadow core arrangement, for example, uh, of, of an HPM, perhaps. Um, and again, because you've, the superset is driven by that D and that 555 depth, you could fit any of the A's and B's uh, that you want in, in a two by configuration. And in this example, the only thing that doesn't work would be your C. And the reason for that is because the connector positioning, like the S SEMs, the NICs, the riser slots, have to be driven by a pitch, right? That's for, for two HPMs next to each other. And since C335 is fundamentally driven by a 19 inch rack, um, it's not gonna play as well with a D that's driven by the 21 inch rack because the D will be on a larger pitch. And lastly, on this, this example, maybe you have an AI chassis, right? Maybe you have something that uh, your GPU accelerators are in, and you need a head node or a head uh, uh, HPM with a CPU. Well, you may go right to a, a fairly small form factor like A305 to be that, you know, maybe one or two to N uh, GPU relationship, and probably you're not going to be supporting some of the larger form factors in that application.
Okay, so we talked a lot about SDNO, the new spec. We want want to touch on how it compares and contrasts with the previous specs. You know, we don't think they're invalid or going away. So a common question is, you have this FLW specification. There's a new C thing that's also the full width of a 19-inch rack. You know, why do we need both, right? And when I think about FLW, it, it's really a very purpose-built, optimized for your classic uh, monolithic server, 1U, 2U, hot aisle I.O., uh, it's very efficient in packaging because the power supplies mate directly to the HPM, um, which is a, a blessing for packaging, but can be a curse in some ways because it somewhat ties the HPM to that uh, chassis wall boundary. You can see some examples on the show floor where people did some clever things to cable power in, but fundamentally the design point is for that classic model you see here. Um, and those cutouts for the power supplies also pinch down the space you have to route uh, I.O., um, on that near side of the board. So in some of these AI systems where you have a, a million lanes of IO you're trying to get out, uh, that can be challenging. Conversely, the Estino board, it's a little more of a Swiss Army knife. It's not as coupled to the side of the chassis because the power is cabled in. Um, so we show it here. It, that could be the, the cold dial, the hot dial. Uh, the HPM's free to float a bit. Um, we've made the NIC optional. So the only kind of coplanar thing that sets your chassis location is the coplanar SCM. Um, as we move towards a new embedded SCM, that constraint will go away as well, and we'll be able to you know, put that HPM right in the middle of the board um, if you so desire. So it's a little more flexible, but it's not as purpose-built for the, uh, or well-optimized for that one exact use case. Um, and as Brian highlighted here with the FLW board, because it was optimized for two socket, you have to offset the CPU if you're trying to build a big one socket with a lot of dims. Here, we have this nice rectangular shape. The CPU position can be centered, so you can take full advantage of fanning memory out on each side. And because you don't have those power supply cutouts, you can get more I.O. lanes. So um, two different boards with different um, pros and cons for two different use cases. And then, you know, another common question that w walking the show floor and talking to people, I think this is pretty well understood, which is great. Um, but if you haven't read the spec closely, you might say, hey, there's 50 of these Dino Type 2 boards out here. Um, and you're talking about what you're calling an A305, and it looks the same. Um, and going back to what Brian said of where we started, we kind of started with that DNO spec and tried to grow the framework. Um, so. Uh, a type 2 DNO that you see out on the show floor, I saw a couple of them labeled A305. They are 95% the same. If I asked you what's different, if you haven't read the 100 pages of the spec, you probably couldn't tell me, right? Um, and so you can think of these as similar, but what we did with SDNO, as Andy described, is now that length can vary, right? So it's not tied to 305 millimeters anymore if you need to go bigger. And I saw an A335 out there. Um, you can. Um, and then it's really about the future forward compatibility. The reason we had to change some things is so that we could get all the way from that smallest class A half width 19 inch board to a full 21 inch wide class D board in a common uh, chassis feature set. Um, we also want to note, and I saw a couple of presentations that mentioned this, if, if you're asking the question, hey, I, I'm designing a DNO board because that spec was available, you know, what does that mean for me? The spec will tell you how you can describe, you can do an HPM that is technically uh, the superset, so it would work in a DNO chassis and an SDNO chassis. And similarly, you can design your chassis to accept the old DNO type 2 as well as the new SDNO. A305, there is a little, there are steps you have to take to do that though, so. And um, this is just kind of, uh, you know, showing a bunch of HPMs in the expo hall. A lot of these pictures are actually from last year, so you'll see a lot of um, FLWs, DNO type twos, no surprise. I think if you go out there now, you, we could probably add 10 pages of this. So there's probably 100 boards out there. Um, especially interesting was that I saw an Estino A, an Estino B, and an Estino D already on the show floor, which is great since the spec hit the contribution database like a month ago. Um, so yeah, and a, and a great mix of folks who are a part of DCMHS, the work group, and then um, people who've come along for the journey with us here. So. 
And then talking a little bit about what's next. So one of the things we're working on, uh, Brian and Sean mentioned earlier, is the path to 48 volts. So obviously, you know, power, 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 right? Uh, the specs being limited to 12 volts uh, is challenging. So what we've done is we've been developing the 48 volt, what's called an addendum here. So this is a separate document that's just tracking the 48 volt architecture enablement. Um, that's available on our wiki now, 0.6. Brian's gonna upload 0.7 soon. Um, and, and now that we've got that relatively stable at 0.7, we're starting to work to incorporate that into the HPM spec. Uh, so the plan is probably in the next couple months, you'll see uh, the HPM specs updated, at least SDNO. Um, so you, you will have what you need to do a 12 volt HPM, a 48 volt HPM, or even have both 12 and 48, and that's inclusive of ingress and egress for peripherals. So. Um, and then just a couple other what's next. So uh, Brian mentioned at the beginning, we're working on a maintenance update for FLW and Dino. Uh, this is to try and align all three documents uh, as best as we can, make sure we keep the old specs up to date with anything new or errors that we find, uh, the incorporation of 48 volts, and then the new uh, DCSCM embedded or internal form factor, think of it as a vertical one U form factor. Uh, and, and that really, if you look at all the MGX boards, you know, they're, the HPM's in the middle of the chassis, there's a vertical 1U management module. Similar idea, de decouple from the last coplanar connector on the SDNO board so you, to give maximum flexibility of where you place it. And then, you know, participating with the Open Systems for AI initiative. Um, we think with SDNO and that internal form factor, 48 volts, we have a, a pretty good story for an AI HPMs, but I'm sure there's some more things we can do that we'll learn along the way, so. And just our last call to get involved. So we've been having public calls for going on two years. Um, so join the public calls, send us emails, um, check out the wiki. There's three of them now across MHS. Um, and let us know there's CAD, there's training videos, et cetera, not just specs, so. And I think we're out of time. <laughs> Is there any questions in one minute? All right. Are you guys gonna standardize the power delivery board? Uh, we haven't talked about standardizing the PDB. Um, Interesting idea. I think we give some guidance, um, but. Uh. Um, on that question, I think with the AI systems that you've seen out on the show floor, they have the bus bar clip. Um, we showed it on a, a slides a couple back. Um, the basic idea is delivering the 48 volt to the HPM, but not limited to that. So if you do need a power delivery board, it would be, um, advantageous for us to standardize that like you suggested. So I think that's on the list, probably just um, needs more discussion and debate how to best do that. Okay, I think we're out of time, thank you. Yep, thank you.